I really wanted to start this talk with a classically humorous story that was sure to captivate you all immediately. But then I remembered, or more specifically, I was reminded by my encouraging older brother that people don't generally think I'm funny. <laughs> so that idea was out of the question. Instead, I'll begin by disclosing that, to many of your surprise, I'm not actually a doctor. In fact, my current experience in the world of medical sciences is limited to about eight weeks spent working in a neuroscience lab at Loma Linda University and an additional 11 days, one hour spent watching Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> In case you are curious, that is the amount of time it will take to watch all Grey's Anatomy episodes from start to finish, which I've done several times. <laughs> but despite my love for medical dramas, I am about nine to ten years away from either an MD, PhD, or if I'm really ambitious, which I tend to be, both. Oh. Thinking about the next decade of my life, I can't help but feel a little overwhelmed. If in high school alone I feel stressed out over having to balance grades, extracurriculars, and sleep in order to even be considered at my dream college, what is my stress in applying to medical school going to be like? But a stressful life, as I'm sure you're all well aware, is not just limited to ambitious high school students like me. People of all ages and of all pursuits can experience stress in their lives whether their stress is associated with work, school, finances, relationships, or pretty much any other aspect of life. The modern American generation appears more stressed out than ever. We're regularly witnessing stress all around us. Think about it. Parents are stressed. Students are stressed. Teachers are stressed. Starbucks baristas can't help but be stressed when some of their customers order a skinny vanilla latte with soy milk and no foam during their morning rush hour. <laughs> How many of you, by the show of hands in the past week, have heard somebody else complain about some type of stress in their life? Thanks. <laughs> and how many of you in the past week have yourself complained about some type of stress in your life? Because I know that's the one I'm guiltiest of. So pretty much all, maybe except the lucky few, are a little stressed, I'm assuming, on a regular basis. But is all of this stress really attributable to the hectic circumstances of our life? Any junior student that has taken the SAT might be compelled to say yes. But what if all of this stress is only a result of our inability to manage it? What if the reason that today we all appear so stressed out is because our bodies have become biologically incapable of managing stress? To understand how we deal with stress, it's crucial to understand how our body's primary stress response, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA axis, works. The HPA stress response begins when our lives become stressful. Stress activates regions of the brain, specifically the hypothalamus. And when it receives the stress, the hypothalamus, realizing it cannot deal with the stress on its own, produces a hormone known as corticotropin-releasing hormone. Now, corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH, um, travels to the anterior pituitary for some help, which is conveniently located just under the hypothalamus. Now, the anterior pituitary says, man, I can't deal with this either, and produces a hormone known as adrenal corticotropic hormone, or ACTH. ACTH says, got a blast, and <laughs> travels all the way down to the adrenal glands, which are located just above the kidneys. Fortunately for us, the adrenal glands actually know how to deal with the stress, and they produce a hormone known as cortisol. Cortisol is important in the stress response because it is our body's main stress hormone. And the way that it allows us to deal with stress is by facilitating the release of glucose, which facilitates the release of energy that allows our body to deal with stress. But when we're no longer under stress, we don't need cortisol anymore. 
So excess cortisol that has been produced travels back to the brain and tells it to shut off the HPA axis in what is called a negative feedback system. Now this is efficient because we're no longer dealing with stress and we're no longer making the stress hormone. It's not a bad design, most of the time. The previously mentioned eight weeks I spent studying at Loma Linda University were spent investigating this beautiful stress response. Specifically, the goal of our lab was to determine the effects of a high-fat diet on the HPA axis. The study involves an adolescent model of rodents, and we chose this model for two reasons. One, we chose adolescents, since adolescence is a critical period for brain rewiring. So if we are going to see a change in the HPA axis, we would expect to see it during adolescence. Two, we chose using a rodent model because apparently a study involving stress and high fat diet in humans would be considered unethical. <laughs> so we used a rodent model. And although there were a lot more rats in the study than shown here, we essentially did just divide them into two groups a controlled low fat diet group and an experimental high fat diet group. For a prolonged period of time, we fed the rats their designated diets. And we conducted behavioral testing in order to assess how the rats were responding to stress. But on a molecular level, we were measuring HPA activity by measuring a hormone known as corticosterone. I haven't mentioned corticosterone, but we're familiar with it because I did mention its equivalent in humans, which is cortisol. In rats, corticosterone is simply the product of the stress response. And so we used it to assess how the rats um, were releasing hormones under stress. In our low fat diet group of rats, we saw a healthy stress response. In a healthy stress response in rats, corticosterone levels are the highest at night when rats are most active, and then lowest during the day when rats are least active or asleep. So basically what would be considered the opposite of humans. And our low-fat diet rats maintain healthy levels of corticosterone fluctuating appropriately over day and overnight. But our high-fat diet group of rats didn't maintain a healthy stress response. And as you can see on this graph, release significantly decreased amounts of corticosterone both during the day and during the night. This did suggest that for some reason their HPA access had become less active and were not releasing the hormone they were supposed to when they were supposed to. You can think of these results as a result of something we're all familiar with, habituation. Looking around this audience, I noticed that quite a few of you are wearing glasses, and although I cannot pinpoint exactly who, I'm going to assume that quite a few of you are wearing contacts as well, both of which on a regular basis. But do you notice that you're wearing them? I mean, obviously you know that you're wearing them, Yet, you don't constantly feel the pressure of them on, their, on your face if you're wearing contacts, or the presence on the, of them on your eyes if you're wearing contacts. It's because we get used to them, and eventually stop responding to their presence. The reason that we saw decreased levels of corticosterone in rats was because, like habituation of glasses or contacts, their HPA axis had been desensitized. With continual exposure to stress, it has been shown that the HPA axis can be desensitized. So with constant exposure, they're no longer healthy stress responses. But in our study, the discrepancy was that the high-fat diet rats, in comparison to the low-fat diet rats, had not been under an unusual amount of stress, and in fact had been under the same circumstances as the low-fat diet rats. The only variable between them was their diet. 
high fat versus low fat. The high fat diet rats developing a blunted, damaged stress response while the low fat diet rats were seemingly unchanged. Now the implications of this study did suggest that the high fat diet was acting in the place of a stressor, constantly activating the HPA axis, eventually desensitizing it to the future ability to manage stress. The results of the study shockingly become a little more relevant in humans than in rats. Mainly because, unlike humans, most rats don't strive to attend a prestigious university, or they don't strive to maintain a healthy relationship. And perhaps more importantly, they do not visit, hopefully, McDonald's as often as humans. This study becomes particularly important in America today when more and more people have grown up consuming a high-fat diet on a regular basis throughout their childhood and adolescence, perhaps in the process rewiring their own ability to manage stress in the future. It's imperative that we all begin to consider a high-fat diet as more than just a threat to our waistlines, but a threat to our biological capacity to manage stress. The majority of us strive to create happy lives. And this might just only apply to me, but a happy life does not consist of unbearable amounts of stress. We don't want to stress over financial instability. We don't want to stress over relationship problems. We don't want to stress over complex Starbucks orders. We do not want to stress if you're a student like me overtaking the SAT. And teachers, please hear me when I say that we do not want to be stressed over the excessive amounts of homework that you assign us every single night as much as you don't want to be stressed over having to grade it all. over these often uncontrollable circumstances. We have to sometimes. In life, stress is inevitable. But when we have a healthy stress response, this is okay. When we have a healthy stress response, we can be resilient in the face of stress. But if we have an unhealthy stress response, that has been constantly overworked by the consumption of a high-fat diet, this might not be okay. When we have an unhealthy stress response, we will not be able to manage stress without facing its anatomical and physiological consequences, like headaches, fatigue, or one that a lot of us are concerned about, weight gain. A high-fat diet is a type of stress. And although we cannot control the majority of stress in our lives, we can try our best to control the stress we receive from our diet. So I encourage you all to consider resisting the temptation of pizza, chicken wings, or for us Californians, the classic order of animal-style fries, a double-double, and a chocolate milkshake from In-N-Out, which despite Mrs. Niemeyer's previous um, disclaim or claim might not be worth the stress. But the idea is consider placing the possibility of a less stressful life ahead of the desire to settle for the convenience of a high fat diet. Thank you.